beginning again. I'm sorry for those who have to bear with me for another session. They took 15 seconds away from us. Oh, yes, because they, they were doing all the very long, underrated, overrated. So I'm here with Gilles Gade, who's the CEO of Cross River Bank. Hi, and Anna. instead of me going on about what Cross River Bank, I'd like him to start by giving us an intro of what Cross River um, does, in case you're not familiar with it. In case I, probably a lot of people are not familiar with Cross River <laughs> at this stage. Um, we aspire to be a one-stop shop for the payment ecosystem. How's that? Please, elaborate further. Um, we, we like to provide uh, origination services for marketplace lenders, payment services for uh, payment uh, companies, uh, whether they be money service businesses, third-party payment processors, cryptocurrency exchanges, and marketplaces. Um, we provide it all. Um, accessibility to payment rails, um, data management, um, obviously settlement accounts, connectivity to the payment rails, and, um, and obviously we'll provide core banking system um, underlying this entire universe so that we can be very agile. It's all real time, it's not batched. Um, we're very agile, we can actually adapt and uh, provide the customized services to all our clients. So you're a bank for fintechs? Yep. Um, so we're, we're an infrastructure play. Yeah. Yes. So what do you, role do you see yourself, what role are you playing now and do you see yourself playing in the future sort of fintech ecosystem? So um, the role we're playing now is really bank as a service. It's very fragmented. So in other words, somebody comes to us and says, we'd like an origination platform. So uh, we have 16 marketplace lenders as clients, um, some of which you may have heard of, like a firm, like uh, Upstart, like uh, Marlette, uh, just a rocket launch to name a few. We originate roughly um, about a, a nine, between 900 and a billion dollars of loans on a monthly basis, which uh, average loan size is about 2,500 bucks. So, um, you know, think of it as anywhere between 500 to 600,000 loans monthly. Um, so some just come for, for, the, for that. And then others come like Coinbase, for example, on the payment side, uh, we provide ACH services, push to card, um, real time uh, account creation, virtual accounts, um, potentially debit card origination, all real time, all virtual, if they so choose. Um, so right now it's been a very fragmented, like I mentioned, bank as a service. And then it's important to think that we're a bank. So that means that you don't need to be approved by us as bank as a service um, you know, provider, and then you have to still seek for a bank to do all the transactions. Um, you don't have to be approved of that. It's one stop shop, it's all integrated. Um, and then I would say in the future, we'd like to be there for all those who have uh, gr you know, greater aspirations, whether it be lenders becoming payment companies, payment companies becoming lenders, and us uh, you know, sitting in the middle and creating this closed loop of money exchange um, just to do three things. Number one, reduce cost, increase efficiencies, and uh, decrease latency. Do you think more banks will sort of be like you going forward unintentionally? They'll end up being the sort of rails and the plumbing and not the, the front end? So I think a lot of banks will try. Um, it's, um, it's definitely a model that has proven to be a valid model in the, uh, you know, serving the uh, fintech ecosystems. I believe wholeheartedly that the fintechs are here to stay and to thrive in this environment. I think there's a, a decentralization of uh, the ownership of the consumers. Um, and the big banks, or even the community banks for that matter, um, are studying or even have lost the battle to, for the consumers and the small businesses. Um, and because they aspire to do a lot more things than just you know, having to go to their local branch and you know, connecting to uh, the folks in the branch, that's, that's great. And that's still going to probably last for the next uh, couple of decades. But this is a, um, a breed that is dying. I mean, this is something that you know, today we need to move at the speed of light, we need to create exchanges, we need to adapt to AWS and the marketplace environment, it's a totally different environment today. Um, so the traditional companies still are gonna go to their local branches, um, but you know, as we continue to evolve t towards a, uh, an AWS environment, I think um, more and more uh, banks like ours will uh, probably thrive in that environment. So rather than being just a business, a bank for businesses where you give them an account, you have to give them all the surrounding tech. Right. right. I mean, we're, we're more like channel driven. So in other words, uh, you know, a company that is very deep in a, in a small business environment like a Stripe or a Cabbage, for example, they'll come to a bank like us and say, we like the one-stop shop strategy. 
would like to offer both a bank account and a lending outfit, a lending uh, capability. The lend the capability could be through a, the issuance of a card, it could be through a term loan, or it could be through an MCA, whatever the case may be. We just want to be able to offer that fully integrated in a closed loop um, and um, with very little technology left. Everything is API based and fairly easy to integrate. Could you, do you think it's feasible to become you if you're already a bank or that you have to be built from scratch to do what you're doing? In other ways, how do you make the business model work or shift to this type of business model? So I, I think it's very difficult for a bank as a, I'm sorry, for a bank as a service provider that is not a bank to provide the underlying core. Uh, the, the core is the most complicated piece of the puzzle here. So you have like three layers of technology. You have the core processor, you have the middleware, and then you have the front end, right? You can develop any front end you want, sell it on a white label basis. That's a, that's a lift that is, I, I, I wouldn't say trivial, but this is some, something that is done over and over, whether it's a wealth management company, or it's a, a robo-advisor, or it's a, a, you know, a challenger bank. So these are, you know, they're prevalent in the marketplace. The core providers, you don't see that many that are providing the bank integrated with a core pro provider offering. Um, so I think this is a key differentiator that um, I think it's going to be a little bit more difficult to, um, to break. Um, we, we believe we have a little bit of a first mover advantage. Uh, we're going to try to preserve it, but we welcome the competition because, you know, it keeps us on our toes. What areas do you see more opportunity for partnerships? In terms of fintech areas, where do you see it growth more? So the gig economy obviously comes to mind. Um, being able to provide, and again, it's the battle, the battle for the consumer, the battle for the small business. So who owns, you know, that, uh, you know, the uh, critical mass of the small businesses and the consumers? And you could make an argument that Nike, for example, or Starbucks, or, you know, obviously, you know, the three uh, big tech companies, Apple, Google, and, uh, and Facebook, they quasi own the consumer. Now, to have a, a financial wrap on that consumer to be able to offer them on a white label basis a, a, a bank account with all the aspirations of that consumer's financial life um, has a lot of validity without becoming a bank. And that's where we come into play. So we are the bank behind that, but also the bank as a service offering. Or oh, like we like to call a bank as a platform at this stage because it's all these services integrated. So you mentioned you have lots of clients in the um, peer-to-peer and, and marketplace lending. So uh, you know people always say they haven't that, that sector in particular hasn't gone through a credit a full credit cycle. So are you exposed to that if, in case? You of course. Know, and and how do you? It would be foolish that? to think we're not. Okay. I mean, everybody's exposed. I mean, both the marketplace lenders, and, and, and we believe wholeheartedly in skin in the game. We, we like the loans. If we make the loans, we've got to like the loans. So we buy 10%, between 10 and 15% of our production um, from most of our marketplace lenders. Uh, I mean, this is a critical component to our success. We, we need to be exposed. Now, it comes down to two things. Number one, compliance and risk management. Um, so if we're fully aware of the past of the historical credit crisis, we obviously put risk management in place. That that means you have adequate capital and adequate reserves. And they're totally different, by the way. People have a tendency to confuse. If I have adequate capital, I don't need the reserves. They are two totally different things. They have two totally different, different objectives mm -hmm. and uses. Um, for a compliance misgiving, for example, because we are exposed to our 16 clients, if they are uh, you know, on the front line and doing something, we're here to check and to verify, obviously. But if they are here and they're doing something egregious to the consumers, we've got to be with the last line of defense, and the FDIC is going to come after us, and we, we have to be ready for that. So that's the reason why we have to have adequate capital. Now, for the loans that we're holding on balance sheet, right? So for that, we need to have adequate reserves, you know, to uh, put some some money for the rainy days, because we believe ultimately, you know the party is going to be over at some point. We've got to be ready for it. So what's your general set? I'm not saying, I'm not asking you to comment specifically on, on, your, <laughs> on your clients, but just generally on, on marketplace lending. If there is, you know, there's now more concerns about a, a downturn. Do you see it shaky? Do you think it, people are, are underestimating how solid they are maybe? Or, or? No, I think it's a totally different environment. I think they, the marketplace loan in general 
is not as exposed as you know, the CDOs that were around the, uh, the mortgage-backed securities. Um, I mean, it's, it's a, um, I believe it's a safer environment. We're fully aware of you know, potentially the risk inherent to a securitization or uh, to a loan program that is on the forward flow basis. Um, people do have proper risk management in place. So I think we can weather the storm. The problem is going to be, is there enough liquidity in the marketplace to be able to continue to originate those loans? And the same reason why the HELOC market went out, um, that created the opportunity for the marketplace lenders to come in. So we saw that in the midst of a credit crisis, we are at a revitalization of a lending um, activity. Right? That's, that was exactly in the middle of that credit crisis that this occurred. So there's no reason to believe that this can happen again. So in other words, there are the ones that are going to be hurt very badly, and they're the ones that are prepared for that, and through, like I mentioned, like adequate capital and risk management procedures. So you mentioned you also work with Coinbase, and you know one of the challenges that crypto companies have is not it's very hard for them to find banking partners or even just bank accounts. So does it mean less so today? <laughs> it's, it's, you, it's a lot easier today. I mean. It, are you banking Coinbase because it's Coinbase, or are you open for crypto? What was no, we, start, we started when Coinbase was a small company. We started about four and a half years ago. Um, because, like you said, nobody else want, wanted to bank Coinbase at the time. Um, so we were very fortunate to be introduced by uh, one of our investors, by Andrews and Horowitz. And, um, and we said we're very interested. We, we did a white paper on it. Um, I think that's the approach, though. It's, it's like, uh, do they have adequate... Um, policies, procedures, risk assessments in place? Do they understand, do they have a DNA of compliance? Um, and do they have the right staff uh, to be able to evaluate that compliance module? So once they have this, so it makes us feel a lot more comfortable. And then there's no reason why the regulators wouldn't you know, jump on the bandwagon and, and, and help us regulate that industry. We've been a big proponent of that, and that has worked for the past four and a half years with the FDIC. There's no reason to believe that you know, a new entrant or a new technology is not going to meet the same fate, provided there is a bank out there that is prepared to take the risk to challenge, you know, the frontiers of regulations. Um, that's the reason why we've been very fortunate over the past four and a half years in the crypto space, and I would say over the past eight years in the marketplace lending space, is precisely because we challenge the frontiers, we challenge the status quo. We were not satisfied with can't do it, so it's never been done. Well, it's about time that it gets done. So, you know, they're going to need a bank, would like to be that bank. And if it puts us out of business, at least we tried. Okay, all right. <laughs> so, yeah, diff maybe not the same thing you would hear from the CEO of, an of another bank, definitely different. Um, so what, what's ahead, what's on the horizon for Cross River in the last, next year? So what's going to keep you guys busy? So, um, we, we, we love the space, obviously. We, we would like to create this closed-loop environment. The technology is there, now it's a matter of starting to convince people um, to become this platform, this AWS of banking. So in other words, um, you have a slew of uh, you know, uh, payment companies on the one side and then lenders on the other side. Now you come in, you're a new, new entrant, and it could be like a reverse referral. Uh, so for us to go to a Stripe and saying we have this great company, they have great aspirations, they became a client of ours, they're not a client of yours. Um, you know, it could be because you're fully integrated via API through us, it's an easy uh, technology lift. So um, th this is basically the, the aspiration is to become that platform that enables any company to come in and plug in and just have a drop down and select the service that they want. If they want a Quovo, if they want a Plaid, if they want a Stripe, if they want a, a WorldPay, they're all there connected to us because they're all our clients already. Um, so it works on the reverse. It's exactly the way that Amazon worked way back then when they started their AWS. So what about geographically? You guys are here now. Does the model replicate worldwide, you think? Are you looking outside? So that's a great question. So uh, we, one thing is for sure, we're not going to start buying banks overseas. Okay. Okay, so that I could put that on the table. Deutsche Bank it's is not. for sale. Too yes. Good. Yeah, Deutsche Bank is for sale. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, so, uh, uh, overrated, by the way. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, so, I, I, I would say the best way to go about doing this, and we haven't cracked it yet because it's a very complicated regulatory compliance module, is to partner on the correspondent banking level with a lot of the challenge banks worldwide. 
And, and we have identified about seven jurisdictions where we'd like to, and we have identified players in those jurisdictions as well, whereby we create this network, it's a messaging in the cloud, and whereby you create an account for a consumer, let's say in Germany, and there's a mirror account created immediately across Eurobank, and the funds are mirrored on both sides of the Atlantic. And now it's just a matter of reconciling or settling the transactions, you know, intraday or at the end of the week if there aren't that many transactions. Um, and all fully integrated on the virtual account, and that, that account is capable of holding multi-currencies, including multi-assets. It could be crypto assets, it could be your mileage, it could be, um, you know, it could be your coupon or your groupons, it could be anything. Uh, it's basically a repository of all your assets on one bank account that is transferable, that is passportable. Um, and um, and the, the technology complication is twofold. Number one is we need to integrate those, you know, international banks into one. And number two, and that's through, you know, onboarding KYC, but also the compliance, the AML, is it has to have like a global AMA capabilities that takes the stringencies of all the jurisdictions. And it has to be automated. So we've been working on this for the past couple of years. It's a pretty exciting uh, endeavor. Uh, we'll see if we can, uh, you know, execute on that strategy, but we're putting everything in our camp to be able to execute on that. What are the challenges on, on data privacy around that, like the different fragmentation of rules around it? Because, you know, when you, when you speak to incumbent banks and you say, hey, I'm your client in the UK, I moved here, you have no idea who I am, why do you have to KYC me again? A lot of the reason is because, you know... So we don't. So okay. the premise is that once they're KYC'd by our challenger bank corresp correspondent, they automatically KYC'd by us. So the rigors imposed on that consumer is going to have the, uh, the local FCA laws as well as the laws from our country. And the same thing, if th that account wants to be passportable also to, let's say, to China or to Hong Kong, it has to have the stringencies of the AML uh, and KYC compliance over there. And so, so just generally, and on the fintech sort of landscape, what, what trends are you looking at? What, what do you think is really interesting? So we, we see a lot of folks, um, you know, the line between payment and, and lending is becoming very, very blurry. And we see a lot of folks on the payment side becoming lenders and vice versa. Um, so I think that's pretty exciting. And that means that they're not making enough money in one area and they need to bridge the gap and they think that they're going to make a lot more money on the other side. Um, the funny part is that neither of those fintech companies are making money yet, <laughs> right, on both sides right now. So. You know, it remains to be seen whether they can make money, but most, most likely the reason why they can't is because, because of the cost of acquisition of consumers and small businesses. So once they have that clientele, it becomes a lot more efficient to offer them a loan, for example, if they are a payment company, like Coinbase, going back to Coinbase again. Um, I think it would be fairly easy for them to offer, you know, a margin lending facility to the 23 million consumers buying cryptocurrencies. Um, so that's just an example to mention. And what's the biggest, before we do the overrated, underrated, what, what's the, what are the biggest risks for the industry, you think? What is your biggest concern? I think regulatory alignment. Um, I think the world is doing a pretty good job. I think in the United States, we're still lagging behind. The main reason is because we are to compose as a bank to, uh, with uh, 12 regulators. I mean, I stopped counting out 12. There were probably a lot more. And that's just at the federal level. And then you have 50 states also. So and each state wants to have you know, a say on how the regulatory compliance is going to play out for the fintech world. So there are a lot of misconceptions about protection of consumers, misconceptions such as, well, every single NPL has got to be a paid-in lender, and they've all got to uh, abuse the consumers to death. There's nothing could be further from the truth. I mean, it's, it just takes a very long time to educate the regulators, particularly the state regulators, that this is not the case, and you need to start compartmentalize you know, the businesses in, uh, in the silos and, and understand them better. So we're not there yet. I don't think we breached that gap yet with our regulators. But we have, we have a seat at the table, We're, you know, through our government affairs office. Um, and uh, I think it's important for all of us collectively to, uh, you know, join forces and, and, and try to convince the regulators that this is the right way to go. All right. So time for the overrated, underrated. First one, open banking. Overrated or underrated? Um, overrated. Why? <laughs> ah, that's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. I'll well, it, 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 I'm just going to give up. I was, so let me qualify the, uh, the answer. So small o, 
um, you know, small b or capital O, capital B. Mm -hmm. In Europe, you know, it's all capitals. Here in the U.S., it's small o, small b. So that's why it's so underrated. In the United States, it's, I mean, uh, overrated. Over there, it's more underrated. What about incumbent banks? Overrated. Blockchain. Overrated. Bank charters. Underrated. Fintech regulation. Severely underrated. Amazon. How could you ask a question like this? I mean, I don't know. I wasn't. Uh, could they be? They just I gave mean, me the paper. They, they, <laughs> who do I complain to? The, 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 Customer the service. Room. Yeah, yeah. Please help me out. <laughs> Overrated. Okay, so <laughs> I've got to say something. I don't know what to say to be honest with you. Right. Something controversial. Thank you. This this is. Thank you moderate. very much, Anna. Thank, Thank you. you guys. The next moderator is Penny Crossman from American Bankers.